Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your, your person, whatever it is. But today I'm a father. Happy Father's Day, Bruce. And I'd like to wish everyone out there in the viewing audience Happy Father's Day. Some of which happen to be women nowadays. <laughs> and men, both, okay? But anyway, Happy Father's Day, okay? But now what we're going to do, we're going to have, I mean, right up front with you, you choose the education forum that I've been working very close with, Deborah and... Deborah, them have really hit it again out of the ballpark, and I really appreciate it. Thank you again, Deborah. I appreciate it very much because the topic today is one that Oregonians really need to kind of get a better sense of what's going on, and that's one of the reasons why I'm working very closely with the Education Forum of You Choose. And today's show is going to be very interesting. Very interesting. In fact, what is going to, I'll basically read this piece. It says, "Illegal immigration are the state new laws good for Oregon and its citizens." Again, this is a subject matter a lot of times we don't want to talk about. But, you know, we've got issues here in Oregon, and we want to talk about these, these issues in Oregon across the board in a nonpartisan way. The fact of the matter is it's not political. It's business. You know what I mean? It's about Oregon, Oregon and the situation that we're in. And some of the topic areas that we're going to probably get into are things like should, should illegal immigrants be given Oregon driver's license? How do illegal immigrants impact jobs in Oregon? Is in-state tuition for illegal immigrants physically sound policy when budget shortfalls in our higher education system are cutting deeply? These are questions that Oregonians are asking every day, and they don't, have, they don't know where to go. In some cases, many of the folks that are elected officials who are supposed to be their representative to communicate with them are not communicating with them. And so that's just another side. So the idea here, here's an opportunity, if you will. We're going to try to address these issues with two people that I have here with me today that's going to share their field and their research in terms of how they got to certain, certain points, if you will, because they were frustrated voters themselves in terms of, of uh, trying to figure out what is going on, okay? So that's what we're going to do today. Again, it'll be illegal immigration of the state, new laws, good for Oregon and its citizens. And joining me today are two individuals that I've known for, for a number of time, both Jim and Cynthia. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Ludwig, founder of Oregonians for Immigration Reform, and Cynthia Kendall. OFIR current president. We'll get a feel of what that OFIR is all about, but I, I, I left that out that way just a minute ago. But before we get into that, I want to ask both of them, it's Father's Day, I'd like for them to give a response, you know, however you want to share this with us, but we're going to start with you, Cynthia. What do you feel about Father's Day? Who do you want to identify? How, what do you say about Father's Day? Well, unfortunately, I don't have any living fathers. Okay. I hold dear place in my heart for them, but I would um, say Happy Father's Day to my husband, who I think is just an absolute, the best father on earth. Oh, fantastic. Jim, how about you? Well, I think of my father who served in the Navy during World War II. Uh, because I came across a box of old coins that he had brought back from the war, and it's got coins from the Philippines, uh, India, uh, uh, all kinds of places in the Far East, and it was kind of fun to look through these old coins and visualize him uh, on during World War II on his uh, ship sailing around and and uh, uh, basically joining the war effort. Mm. Good, well, great. Okay, man. Again, Happy Father's Day to everybody. Now let's get into this other discussion to both fathers and mothers out there that are concerned about different issues. I, and you know, I think what we'll start, and before we get into the, the areas that I had made mention to you all on the, on the, on the viewing screen, uh, these folks can maybe give us a little background in terms of how they got to that particular point. And it, it seems as interesting, Senate Bill number 833 was kind of like the, the bill, if you will, that really got this into a formal kind of an area responding to some of the issues and their concerns. And they, boy, they did some work, I tell you. They did their due diligence. And so we're going to get that discussion. In fact, we're going to do that the first half hour. And then the set, then when we break, we get into the second half hour. There are some specific questions that I'm going to be asking them in reference to some of the areas that will kind of give you a feel of uh, their response to some of the issues that they that were brought up as a result of their research. Is that fair? Okay, so that's what we'll do. And we'll start off with this whole bit of Senate Bill 833. Let's define Senate Bill 833. Start off with you, Cynthia. What do you think? On May Day of 2011, okay. um, Brad Avakian read a letter from the governor stating that 
the governor intended to find a way to put a driver's license or driver privilege cards in the hands of people in the country illegally. Hmm. We waited for something to appear uh, in the 2013, uh, excuse me, it was 2012, okay. in May of 2012, mm -hmm. the letter was read. Um, when the legislature opened in 2013, we tried to find out about this bill and we couldn't find anything out about it. On April 2nd, this bill was introduced on the floor of the Senate. It had one hearing. And what was this bill about? This bill is giving a driver privilege card okay. to people in the country uh, illegally. The only requirements to get the driver privilege card is to show um, a Mexican or a, a matricula consular card okay. and a utility bill showing proof that you live in Oregon. Okay. Two documents that are very easily easily obtained mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> fraudulently mm -hmm. um, and there's really no proof of identity who those people actually are getting those driver privilege cards. The bill uh, was introduced in the Senate on April 2nd. It had one hearing, one public hearing with one hour of opposition testimony and then it was directed into the Ways and Means uh, Committee and directly onto the House floor for a debate with some really excellent remarks from people in opposition to the bill, some legislators. And then it was uh, passed and signed on the steps of the Capitol at the May Day rally. Interesting. Jim, I'm going to bring you in on this deal. Well, first off, who sponsored this bill? Any idea? Well, the, the list of sponsors, they were, you can, you can you read, read, read those off. Yeah, in yeah. Fact, yeah, sponsored by Senators Shields, Chip Shields, Roblin, Thompson, Hansel, those are the senators. And on the representative side was Vega, Vega Peterson, I guess, mm -hmm. Harper, Harker, Johnson, Gilliam, uh, Representative Bailey, Barnett, uh, Hovey, Ken Geyer, Lou Frederick, Frederick, mm, Frederick, Gallegos, Garrett, uh, Gumbirds, Kosak. Oh, Kosak is in here too. Okay, Kotek, yeah. Okay, and and, and Nathanson, Denver. who's this other one? T Tomei, oh, that's Representative Tomei, and Witt. Okay. And Michael Dembro. And Michael Dembro. Now these are these are both all rub now as far as sponsors are these are all Democrats, Republicans or just a There's a few Republicans few in Republicans. there. But basically it's the, the Democratic Party basically. wanted that to go through. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a Republican? Yeah, Chuck Thompson. Chuck Hood Thompson. River. Where is he from? Hood River. Hood River. I remember Chuck Thompson. Isn't he, isn't he in the farm business? Yeah, he's there? in the farm business. What does yeah. he farm? Pa pears. Pears. Picks pears. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, okay. So right. He's kind of got a vested interest in okay. this All whole right. procedure. But okay. let me just give you a little background of where we sure. came from Go on now. this. Okay. Ofer, uh, Oregonians for Immigration Reform is a nonpartisan organization. We okay. have Republicans, Democrats, Tea Party, Constitution Party, Independents, every mm -hmm. kind of group. Because this issue of immigration cuts across every type of social program that goes on. Every facet of American life is impacted to mm -hmm. a certain degree. Mm -hmm. When you look at the environment as an example, uh, a huge influx in population obviously affects the environment. It affects jobs. We've got, what, uh, 180,000 Oregonians out of work, oh, 20 time. million people across the United States. The real unemployment rate in Oregon is, uh, the U6 is close to 18 uh, percent. By giving driver's licenses to people who are here illegally so they can go to jobs undermines the wages of American citizens. But it does more than that. It also undermines good working conditions. If you have a group of people who you can hire that undercuts the existing wage base, who will work different kinds of hours than what's expected of American citizens, you just uh, you create an environment where the American citizen becomes a second choice for the employer. You know, you make a good point because last week, for instance, on this show, uh, we were, I had a young man on who had gone through ballot measure 11, remember 11, mm -hmm. the crime bill aspect yeah. of it. He spent eight years in the institution, and then he's, he's gotten out, he served his time, now he's trying to get back in society hard to find a job, yeah. you know, and we're talking about the whole issue of, uh, of um, the, the, the criminal justice system because the process is that you commit the crime, 
you go and do the time, and then you come back and get a job. And that's part of that, part of the requirement is that when you get out, you're supposed to be able to find a job and have a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And these folks are totally unemployed. Now these are American citizens yeah. that are trying to get back in the situation. So it's good. It's a good point. But, but that's an issue. If, that we you, need. if you look at the Oregon now ranks fourth in the United States in the percentage of teenagers and kids with just a high school degree right. that are unemployed. Right. We're, we're fourth in the nation. It's something like 33% of Oregonians are unemployed who haven't gotten beyond high school. You look at inner city black kids, oh, yeah. it's over 50%. Yeah, yeah. And who are they competing against? They're basically being c competing for jobs against people who come into the country illegally, who oftentimes are paid under the table mm -hmm. so the employer can get around paying Social Security, yeah. workman's comp. It's so much cheaper to hire somebody who's here illegally than it is an American citizen. And so the kids, our kids who should be learning the skills of right. doing jobs, right. are kind of left out in the cold. Boy, you know you bring another good point up. Remember the days in Oregon when young people were able to pick berries? Oh, yeah. That's me. Now they can't, now they can't do that <laughs> they anymore. They can't do that. No. Well, who brought that issue to the table and said no? Well, Any they, idea? They passed legislation. They passed legislation. Yeah. Now the kids can't do that to pick up their clothing and this, that, and the other. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they were doing. Now they're gonna, and this is part and parcel of this whole process. Well, continue on. I'm sorry. I hate to throw. No, that no. It, it, it's the, when you look at the the jobs issue, it it should be a smack in the face to everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a wake up call. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to continue to import the kind of workers numbers we are. Mm -hmm. Uh, the look at the proposal in front of Congress, the so-called Gang of Eight, the big amnesty right, scheme. Right. They're, they want to up the H-1B, which are high-tech worker visas, and the H-2B, which are non-skilled, non-agricultural workers. They want to bring them in. A non-skilled, non-agricultural worker is somebody who would be a fry cook, mm. a landscaper, mm. a, uh, a person who cleans hotel rooms and things like that. They want to import those workers because they can control them with these visas. Uh, when you come in on a work visa, you sign basically a contract with mm -hmm. that one company or that that outfit who's going to hire you and you can't go other places to work. It, it's absolutely wrong that American citizens are put behind people who are brought into the country to do those jobs. Again, another good point. Here in the Multnomah County area, in the Portland Metro, our Portland Public Schools, we don't have vocate over here anymore. No. And this is the highest unemployment rate we have in this area. What happened to voc ed school, if you will? Those, those same careers yeah. that you're talking about could actually be implemented overnight. I think about Intel right off the bat with the high tech piece. They're constantly making the point about importing workers, oh, if yeah. you will. Why not have those voc ed techs in the schools, in the classroom? Fair? Oh, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Keep on. You want to you want to say something Cynthia, about that? Anything particular? Well, I think one of the things um, I have two sons. Sure. Uh, both college educated, and one of the one of the things as we were raising them mm -hmm. um, that we heard repeatedly. I was always raised that any job that you do, if it's an honest job, is worth doing. Yes. You may not want to do it, mm -hmm. and you may want to move up and do something else, but every good honest job is a good honest job mm -hmm. and the message has become so strong that uh, these aren't jobs that Americans will do right you, you, yes and that message to people that would perhaps rather collect welfare or be on food stamps mm -hmm. or do something the message is that that's okay because we couldn't expect you to do these jobs um, is getting sort of pervasive in our society and uh, I think that it uh, it undermines our culture mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. so I I agree with what he's saying that we've We've sort of messed things up by allowing all these visa workers you, you, to you come bring, in. Bring good point. Do you know where that term comes from? I mean, my point is that in your research and investigation on this transportation bill aspect of it, when they brought this issue up about uh, jobs that Americans did not want to do, did you have, was there anyone, as you went through this, uh, this investigative situation, that defined that for you? That would admit the fact that, yes, I, this is why we say this or something like that? In, I've in never heard area. anybody specifically say that. It's just one of those terms that just kind of keeps getting kicked down the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, an, it's an easy thing to say. It's a cliche that really uh, has doesn't have the real meaning of what it should mean. Uh, the I, I, between the three of us, I'll bet there's not a job out there that we ha haven't right. done to a That's certain right. extent. Right. I mean, That's I've right. done construction. I've done all kinds of 
tough labor jobs that now apparently are supposed to be beneath Americans. But we can't con continue to do that. And it comes at a huge cost to the Oregon taxpayers. Yes. It's estimated that illegal immigration costs the st Oregon state taxpayers about a billion dollars a year, even if you subtract out any income taxes they may pay. Now, as you know, we don't have a sales tax in Oregon, so uh, somebody who's here illegally doesn't have to pay that. But by and large, most people who are in the country illegally and working the, the kind of jobs we're talking about don't earn enough money to be required to pay taxes. Now, put aside that 40% of the illegal aliens in the United States are thought to be paid under the table, paid in cash. That being the case in Oregon, since we don't have a sales tax, and they don't pay an income tax because they're paid under the table, who's going to make up that difference? Well, I mean, if you look at the cost of education as an example of either people who are in the country illegally as children or were brought in by their parents who are here illegal, you're looking at a cost of over $700 million a year to Oregon public schools. It's uh, the, the average uh, money spent on a, on a kid in public schools in Oregon, K through 12, is about ten thousand to twelve thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. if they're in the ESL program you add another three thousand dollars per year yeah or ELL whatever you want to call it so that's a huge price to pay it's a price to pay for a program that that doesn't have good results because about eighty three percent of the kids in ESL or ELL programs do not advance into English proficiency every year it's I mean they're static there the school district likes it because they get an extra three thousand dollars per student mm -hmm. money that could be spent on on um, shop classes learning kids to right. do sh the voc ed yeah voc, voc ed implementing to voc do ed, welding yeah. to yeah. do yeah. all Home those ed, kinds all of kind yeah. stuff yes 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 or, or our tag kids exactly 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 you know and you, then you think about our system we have an unemployment division right system yeah. now these are people that are unemployed who are actually getting a check. They're very enthusiastic. They want to go back to work. Father want to go out and make a living, if you will, so he can basically support their family, whether it be a male or a female aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But they, they don't necessarily want, if you will, a check, a wealth. They, no one wants to be identified with a wealth on being welfare. Why can't employers recruit from the unemployment system that we already have in place? Well, because we're paying these yeah. folks, and the, the, the dollars that you're talking about is exactly what we're talking about. Whether it be billion dollars, or whatever, whatever, those are that's money that's coming out of the coffers. Well, for every every person that you have working in our state illegally, right. it's likely that you have somebody on welfare, food yes, stamps, yes, subsidized yes. housing, of some because they right. can't make it on right, their own. Right, 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 so right. it's it's a double win right. if these people leave and our people become right, employed. Right, right, right. And you know, in all due respect, and I think you, you'll agree with me on this, we're concerned about their, their situation too. I mean, in all due respect, they're here. Yeah. The, 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 the definition for being here is that, hey, we can't, we, we can't raise a family. We can't do something in our own country, whether it be Mexico, because that's, that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about Mexico, because that's yeah, our Guatemala neighbor. And that's our major neighbor yeah. contribute to this whole situation. You got me? And so here we are, and like you said, taking services, if you will, in many cases, that's costing quite a bit. That's why insurance rates are going up. That's why we're having all these other problems and whatever. People can't afford it and this, that, and the other. So, that, again, that's another subject matter that we can talk about for days on that piece, too. But it's all within what we're talking about and getting right back to this Senate bill aspect of it. There have been other areas where, where Oregonians like yourself or, or taxpayers or voters are wanting to know what was the rationale, if you will, for doing what you're doing. Now, these people are supposed to be basically responding to and representing you. And here you are out here trying to, <laughs> you basically represent yourself, and the other person is just signing off, like this, this, this uh, Senator Thompson here, right here, who, who has a vested interest, if you will, because he has a, a pair form, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's just not right, if you will. Yeah. And so here you all are doing this kind of a deal. Now, tell me this about this particular bill. Do you know who the sponsors of that bill was? You know, we t I think we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Who's the sponsor of this bill? Well, the, all the people listed there. But but normally in, in this process, oh well, you're talking about the, yeah. Well, the governor, the, the, the governor, the governor appointed a uh, a task force to look into changing Oregon's driver's okay, license. Okay, so the governor is basically the, the governor the is the guy that was pushing this. Okay. Yeah. And when we heard about that, 
that he had pointed this task force, right, I we you. thought we should be a part of it okay. because we could bring maybe a right, different perspective right. than he would get yeah. from the people he Open appointed. process. So Open process. That's all you were looking for. Open. So we called the governor's legislative uh, representative's office, which okay. is supposed to be a liaison between the governor and the public, and said, if the governor's going to have a task force on changing driver's licenses, we'd like to be a part of it. And we were assured by his staff that, yeah, we'll let you know when this process gets started. Okay. So we waited a couple weeks. We didn't hear anything back. We called back to them again and said, you know, we'd like to be part of that process. We're, you know, we, we're kind of afraid you guys may be meeting behind mm -hmm. closed doors. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. We'll let you know all about it. Well, we kept hearing rumors that this group, this task force the governor put together was already meeting. So we discovered that that, in fact, was the case. So we went back to the governor's legislative uh, citizen um, representative's office and said, we know that you guys are already meeting. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh. Hmm. And so we said, we'd like to know who's on the committee, right, right. where they're meeting, and what their agenda Did is. Did they give you a listing of the people who are on the no, committee? No, they wouldn't give us anything. So we asked them for that. We asked them all those, those three questions. And they wouldn't tell us. So we filed a Freedom of Information Act with the governor's citizen uh, representative's office. And we got our letter back from the governor's attorney stating that we don't need to tell you because they're all volunteers. And we said, well, that can't be the correct. They can't all be volunteers. Mm -hmm. And then we discovered that the governor's lead man on this committee was Frank Garcia, who's part of the governor's administration in the Office of Diversi Diversity and Inclusion. Uh -huh. So I went to Frank Garcia's office and said, I'd like to know who's on this committee. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't even meet with me. Hmm. He would he stonewalled us. So we filed a Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. with his with his office to determine who was there. Right. We also filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the governor's office. Mm -hmm. And we, were, we were stonewalled by all of them. Then we heard the DMV was part of the process. We filed a Freedom of Information Act with them. Stonewalled by them. They all kept saying that they didn't need to tell us. There's another process you can do. You can file an appeal of a turn down of a Freedom hmm. of Information Act, which we did with the Oregon's Attorney General. And once again, we were stonewalled. The, this committee had been meeting behind closed doors, uh, coming, building a bill, that in essence would give driver's licenses to illegal aliens. Well, now, when you get this document, when you got this document, this pretty well, this came out. If yeah. you will. In fact, this came out, uh, as I understand. Uh, I don't, uh, don't look at that. It came out April 2nd is April when the 2nd, bill okay. was introduced. Now, they, yes. they listed the sponsored by senators and representatives. Okay. Well, did you contact any of those folks to sure, see whether or not, yeah. what did they do? Did, were they receptive in terms of hearing what you had to say? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But they signed the document. They, they, you know, this is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Am I right or am I wrong? There? Am I? I wish you were right. I'm beginning <sighs> to doubt that anymore. Well, they, they get elected by this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. They were elected, and then fortunately for us, the elections keep coming, and so uh -huh. there can be a turnover. Was there any, was, is there anyone here on the, that, that was sponsored that you figured you had access to? That well, you? the Republicans um, that signed on to the bill, we were um, disappointed. But and Thompson, you, you contacted Thompson? I went to Chuck Thompson, and uh, Senator Chuck say Thompson, to and I said, before the bill was introduced, okay. I went to him and I said, um, you know, we keep hearing these rumors that mm -hmm. there's this bill that's going to come out, and mm -hmm. can you tell me anything about this bill, who's introducing it, who's fine, whatever, and he said, I know, I have no knowledge of any such bill. But his name is right His here. name is right on it, that's correct. Afterwards, I talked to him, and he said that he fully supported um, giving bills to people here because he wanted his um, workers to be able to get back and forth safely to work. Yeah, okay, I see where he's at. Now, what about on the representative side? Was there anybody there that that you guys have recognized that you might have talked to? We've probably talked to all of them. I tried multiple times to get um, an appointment with uh, Tina Kotek, okay. and I was given an appointment with her assistant okay. and um did they talk with you no he was uh, she, he was she, so bored and less engaged with my presence i mean he could have cared less that i was so there. you didn't see tina you know absolutely not they wouldn't mm -hmm. i'm not a constituent so they would not let me tina i'm inviting you come on over and let's talk about this piece uh, again tina i, will I tried be many times via Is email right? phone calls and personal visits to her office well she's very receptive she's very resourceful she's a very strong person and i'm and i'm sure that I, once i give her a call she that's She'll probably be here. an explanation, and maybe she can just come and 
share with the public, and better yet, maybe she might be here with you guys. Well, that would be Bruce, nice. let, let's put the bill in perspective, Going what on. it does. Um, and let me go back to 9-11. Okay. Because on 9-11, obviously everyone knows what happened, Muhammad Atta and his 19 terrorists okay. boarded planes right. and killed 3,000 Americans. Right. The most important document a terrorist can possess is a valid state driver's license. Uh -huh. What, Mah what Muhammad Atta did was he, when he came here on a six-month visa, he went to Florida, got a six-year driver's license. Hmm. He used his driver's license to uh, rent motel school, rooms, you know. open a bank account, take a flying lesson, and board planes on 9-11. Hmm. The 9-11 Commission stated in their report that states needed to get a secure driver's license and have people prove that they're legally here in order to get it. So many states started doing that, including Oregon. In 2008, Oregon passed a driver's license bill that requires proof of legal presence to get a license here. Mm -hmm. what and we were behind that. We were behind that. What this bill, Senate Bill 833 does, the one we're trying to overturn via the referendum process, mm -hmm. does is allows people who are ad almost admittedly illegally here mm -hmm. to get driver's licenses. Uh, I don't know if you've had to renew your driver's license recently, but anybody who has will know the process. Yeah. You've got to go in, you've got to have a valid social security number, mm -hmm. you've got to have your original birth certificate yeah, right. yes, right. or right. a passport. If you can't right. find your original birth certificate, you've got to go back to the hospital, which in my case was decades and decades ago, mm -hmm. to prove who you really are. Mm -hmm. Plus, then you have to have a, an official photo ID and prove you live in the state. Mm -hmm. Under this bill, the one we're trying to overturn via re re referendum, an illegal alien can buy a Mexican matricula card for $25 on many street corners, even around here, and that serves as a photo ID and, according to the DMV now, proof of who they are. The only other document they need is a, a copy of a bill or something like that that's got their name and address on to prove they live in Oregon. So an American citizen and a legal immigrant has a high standard to reach to get a driver's license. Somebody illegally here has a very low standard. Hmm. And what that does is it debases the value of a driver's license. If if somebody who's here illegally can get all get in and get one without really proving who they are, mm -hmm. people are going to start questioning the value even of our driver's license. Well, who initiated that process? You'd have to ask the governor. Jeez. The governor said, but the, but there's a, another factor here. Uh, Oregon and and particularly Portland, Portland, has been decimated by the drug trade. The most important document a drug dealer can have, particularly one coming up south mm -hmm. from the south, mm -hmm. is a valid state driver's license. Because if he, if a Mexican drug cartel guy is pulled over with drugs in his car and he can produce a valid driver's license, the state patrolman doesn't have probable cause to search his vehicle, and he can go on his merry way. The High Intensity Drug Area Trafficking Team, it's called HIDA is the acronym, which is a, an umbrella group put on by the federal government that helps state police, local police, county sheriffs uh, form a task force to stop the, the drug cartels from mm -hmm. penetrating into Oregon. They issued a report this year. Oregon now ranks third in the nation in per capita illicit drug use. We're number three. It's just a terrible thing for us. The number of drug overdose last year in Oregon went up by 20 percent. People who've overdosed for methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. Particularly mostly in the Portland area. Uh, methamphetamine, which is a scourge. Oregon passed a law in 2006 to end the sale of pseudoephedrine is an over-the-counter drug because that's the base ingredient in methamphetamine and they pretty much wiped out the production of methamphetamine here in Oregon but methamphetamine is as prevalent as it's ever been because it's now brought in by the drug cartel hmm. by giving them driver's licenses you're basically saying come on in sell your stuff here this is an amazing statistic and if, if Haida didn't produce it a federal agency I would have doubted it wow. last year there were more people who died of drug overdose in mm -hmm. Oregon mm -hmm. than died behind the wheel of a motor vehicle in a crash. And these are Americans. And these are Americans. Yeah. And why would we want to give a special pass 
to people who are going to pass out our drugs? I mean, that's a question the governor should be asked. Yeah, yeah, because that's point. what this ask driver's him, license bill right does. Now, ask yeah, him, ask governor, him. come on, talk okay. to Bruce. Tell that's him right. why it's a good idea to give driver's license to drug dealers. Uh, talk I, to Oregonians, right? Yeah. <laughs> I attended uh, the National Sheriff's Border School mm -hmm. in El Paso, Texas, and it was um, attended by sheriffs from all over the country. There were undercover FBI agents, there was naval intelligence officers there, and one of the things that they talked about was state-issued identification and how it complicates the issue of the cartel operatives mm -hmm. moving throughout mm -hmm. our country. And Oregon is in such a difficult place, and one of the things that has really, by the people, for yeah, the people, yeah, and yeah. he said you need to file a formal fr protest mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. this, and I did with Tina Kotek's office, and that's what started me wanting to get an appointment with her, mm -hmm. and she wouldn't see me, she wouldn't respond, she never responded to any of my correspondence or my phone calls. Well, you so. know, again, this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm working very closely with you, Choose, in the education form aspect of it, because all of us living in this country are concerned. This is, these are nonpartisan issues. Absolutely. It's, it's right. impacting our pocketbook. We're being asked to pay taxes on an ongoing basis. We've got our education system here. In fact, in the Multnomah County, it's the highest unemployment area. Yeah. It's the highest uh, uh, failure rates in the schools and this, that, and the other. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. These are concerns. And normally when you're talking like this in many ways, people try to put it in a racist form. That if you're not Republican and you're making these statements, mm -hmm. it's racist, if you will. Or you anti this, you anti. We're not talking about this. What we're talking about, and that's why I'm so that's why I'm so closely related with you choosing the education form. We're talking about issues right. that are having impact on everybody, and you can and and, and it's not and it, and the key is that if we've got elected officials that are not willing, if you will, to put this on the table and really educate the people about what it is. And then suffer with it, and, and i.e. the results basically at the end of the day whatever the vote is it's, it's fair and it, it talks to the impacting of the deal you got me and, and we're not doing this and that's why i'm that's why i'm feeling so comfortable about what you're sharing with us today you've educated the, the viewing audience and the governor needs to know this well, and tina kotex uh, and anyone who signed this give the public the opportunity i mean really give them the opportunity educate them about What's your rationale for doing what you did, and how does it impact our way of life here in this country? Fair? Well, well Bruce, even if somebody would get in-state tuition, they're here illegally, right. graduate from college, they can't legally work here. Gee. It's against the law for them to legally work here. And, but they probably could because there are employers who would pay them either under the table or kind of give them a wink and a nod. The last statistic I saw out of Portland was that for every one job that's opened in Portland, there are six applicants for it. Gee. It's no wonder th that's that right. people that's are right. having a hard oh, time. Fantastic. The, the Federal uh, Bureau of Labor s issued some recent statistics. Over the last four years, real wages for high school graduates and college, both high school and college graduates, have dropped by four by ten percent, even factoring in when you factor in inflation. Right. So people are earning less money. There are less jobs out there, yet we have a state legislature that wants to give jobs to people who aren't legally here. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong, something wrong. And that's both R's and D's. That's exactly right, yeah. <laughs> Look, let, let's see if we can, what, mind having a few calls come in? Oh, no, let's have I'll tell you what, uh, put, put the phone line in there. See whether or not we might have some folks that are interested out there that might be able to uh, give, us a, give us a feel for what's going on. Uh, the numbers should be on the screen. And uh, give us a call, and uh, you can hey just throw it throw it on the on the table here. In fact, more particularly, if, if Bob could give me a call or John Sweeney or one of those guys, uh, they've been on the show before, and uh, they're very open about whatever. So anyway, let, let's continue on with reference to responding to the concerns here. I mean, this is a lot of work. I mean, this is a lot of work. This is taking you away from your other daily summer. activities, from yeah. summer activities, <laughs> trying to put this piece together yes. with an organization aspect of it. And all you're basically trying to do is put it on the table so folks can at least look at it in a fair manner aspect of it. And those elected officials who actually initiated the process, you want to know about them. You want them to come to the table and educate us, educate you, 
so you can spend your time in a more productive manner in other areas. Maybe even vote for them if they, were, if you, if they come up with some sense or whatever that well, impacts where we are. Part of the problem, the way that this bill was driven, yes, um, was that it was a public safety issue. And you're what talking was, about the driver's license. The yes, driver's, the license, driver's license. Public safety. Okay. Public safety. Oh, that was, this is the rationale. Now you're talking. Yes. To. Okay. And we'll and what they repeatedly said is, there's nothing we can do about them being here. We have all these people here in the country illegally and here in Oregon illegally, and there's nothing we can do about them being here. So the least we can do is get them these driver privilege cards and get them um, insured. Okay. The fact is that there's a lot that they can do to keep them from being here, like instituting a mandatory e-verify. Mm -hmm. um, we've had several bills that we've brought to the legislature. What's e-verify? What e-verify is a federal um, it's a database between Homeland Security and Social Security where they run the names and Social Security numbers through to verify um, that that person is who they say they are. And it's free. Wow. wow. So businesses, the state, counties uh, can use E-Verify. It's very simple to sign up for it. And it's free. And it's wow. free. Hold your point, just for a second. we got to call it. Oh. Call you on the air. Your question or comment, please. Uh, turn it up. Um, well, turn it up for us a little bit, will you, Dave? Turn it up. Hold up. We can't hear you. Now, keep speaking. Okay, the, uh, talk about your referendum as defensive. Uh, what's the chances of actually doing something offensive to put it forward so the fact that we could get the thing to, to say that uh, you have to follow the federal law or whatever it is and, and not have to fight it on the federal or on a offensive issue every time it comes up, actually just go out there and have something big and offensive and say, this is the law, you must follow the law, and these are penalties, and not civil penalties, Criminal penalties when you put some of people in prison. Good, good. Thank you, John. Thanks yeah. for the call. Well, one of the problems in this, and it's perfectly illustrated by the driver's license bill, it's illegal for an illegal alien to work here, mm -hmm. yet the governor wants to give them driver's licenses so they can go to jobs they can't legally have. Right. We have a, a, a government the and that's the employer morphed should into, not have. Yeah, we've had a government that's morphed into enforcing laws they like and ignoring laws they don't like don't serve their purpose and, and can you imagine that if i said to the governor you know i don't like that law so i'm not going to obey it what would happen to me you go to jail yeah i'd go to jail but <laughs> that's what the government does now they pick the laws they like to enforce and ignore the ones they don't i've talked to lots of people who've immigrated into the country mm -hmm. one of the things that has drawn them here is this this concept of the rule of law where we expect everybody to obey our laws mm -hmm. obviously doesn't always happen mm -hmm. but at least we have that expectation they've come from countries where there are different strata in your society depends uh, on what laws are going to be enforced mm. that's what we're morphing into when we start the government starts picking and choosing which laws they're going to enforce and ignores which ones they don't like how do you feel about the employers in this particular case they play a major role they do okay and uh brad avakian who is the bureau of labor and industries commissioner okay um to our knowledge really does nothing there's clearly if you would just look at the people that signed on to the driver's license bill mm -hmm. um, clearly people who have a vested interest in having those people be able to drive back and forth and to he their signs jobs. off the labor commissioner signs off on these. he read the letter on the steps of the capitol yeah. saying that they were going to do this and get this driver's license bill so um, we have a lot of people in our government system that aren't working for the best for the citizens of the state. They're working harder to make it easier and better for people that are here illegally because we have special interests driving our legislature um, and they're trolling the halls of the Capitol building all the time, making certain that everybody's following their agenda. And it would be a, a wonderful thing to have representatives and senators alike come forward and say this isn't the best for our state mm. this is actually ruining our state and we're going to be attracting even more people here illegally and we need to put a stop to it and we can enforce we can make a law like i started to say we have introduced several bills to require small businesses counties states to use mandatory e-verify and they will not even give us a hearing so your tax dollars that go to pay state employees. We can't even get them to agree that those jobs should go to people that are legal workers in our state. They won't hear it. We've introduced probably 10 bills since I've been with OFER, and they can't even get a hearing. 
So there's, there's clearly an agenda that isn't how can we solve this problem. The agenda is more how can we make it easier for these people to be here. Well, you know, in all due respect, you know, we've been talking about it, but it always comes down to money. It's always about the bottom line, okay? In all due respect, we Americans, uh, in most cases, some, very few, are responsible for the issue that we're in right now. And, I, and I'm throwing it out right out to the farmers for the many ways. They're well, if, to, if one farmer has one worker, right. and, that one, and he's paying that worker under the table, right. and that one worker has a wife and three children, right. the farmer gets the benefit, the taxpayer gets the bill. And that's what's never addressed. What our legislator is ad legislature is addressing is how can we make it easier for that farmer to get back and forth to his job and his wife to get the kids to school. And we heard this in testimony all the time is the wife needs to be able to drive back and forth to doctor's appointments and to parent conferences and all of that. So our legislature is focused on how it's going to make their lives easier as opposed to how it's going to make it better for Oregon citizens and legal residents wow. here. Well, look, we got about two minutes. Any lasting point you might want to make? Let's talk about this referendum thing. Why don't we talk Protect about that? ProtectOregonDL.org. Protect Get Oregon DL. All the information put that, you Put need. that back on the on the screen and uh, and then the phone number, you know, for those who are not uh, capable of using the computer. What's that 503 mm -hmm. You know, it's it's so important, folks out there, that you're looking at this show. Uh, again, we're not, you know, I, I think about the other element in regard either those illegal folks. and whatever. We're really talking about slave labor there, too. The, yeah. you know, we're talking about slave labor, and we went through that process. Oh, in many yeah. Ways, and we said we weren't going to do that. You know what I mean? I can remember that during the Lincoln administration aspect of it said no. Again, a Republican yeah. who did it said no. And in all due respect, he gave his life up for that mm -hmm. situation. And, uh, and well, here I we are today doing the that's same thing. Important to remember is that for the most part, these people have come here voluntarily. Yeah, but I'm just saying, but looking for, in all due respect, to feed their family. But in all yeah. due respect, we've got a country. I mean, it's their country too. And I'm, we're all sensitive about how the conditions that they're living under, sure. et cetera, et cetera, getting paid under the table. I mean, having to hide, not being able to be somebody, if you will, whatever. But that's not helping them out in the long run. It's not. And when you go talk about slavery, not only was it an abhorrent practice, right. but it retarded development yes, of the indeed. South's infrastructure. Yes, it, it, by having that cheap labor that they could move around as much as they want mm -hmm. and take advantage of, they ne didn't have to mechanize. They were retarded uh, I I uh, economically when they fought the war between yes. the North and the South. Yes. The North had could manufacture cannons yes. and locomotives yes. to move troops around. The South couldn't do it. Yes. The, Buying into a cheap labor environment retards progress, yes. and it's the same as it is right now. If you have a, if we're going to turn into a third world country that relies on cheap labor instead of mechanization yes. and improvement yes. in that way and giving good wages, we're going to retard our society. Yes. Well, folks, this is about it. Again, folks who are listening and hearing whatever, hey, again, thank you very much for being a part of it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank Appreciate you. it thank very you. much. Talk to you again soon. Okay. okay. Folks, we'll be back with you. Have a good one. Discuss this issue at home, around the table. Act. Take care. Have a good one. Happy Father's Day.